Just to give a little bit of background about Joshua, headquartered in Houston, West Mermis is a boutique law firm that handles construction litigation, business disputes, and insurance defense. Among other clients, they have represented a number of hospitals and healthcare organizations. Help me welcome Joshua Mermis to the Owner Insight podcast. I'd like to just give a little bit of information about Joshua and his firm. They're headquartered in Houston, Texas. West Marmus is a boutique law firm that handles construction litigation, business disputes, and insurance defense. Among other clients, they've represented a number of hospitals and healthcare organizations. Super excited to have Joshua join us for today's podcast, where we're going to be talking about protecting yourself as an owner in the event of construction litigation. Joshua Mermis, thank you for joining the Owner Insight Podcast. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Good. I've got a whole bunch of things I'm anxious to talk to you about, but our topic today is protecting yourself as an owner in the event of construction litigation. And so I am really interested in getting your insights and experience in this topic because it's something Owner Insight is really passionate about. It's why our software exists. It's really designed to to help protect that long-term interest of the owner. So this is really a pretty fascinating topic because I think there are a lot of organizations out there that don't realize if they're building any type of construction, why it's important as the owner to contain that information. But before we dive into all of that, I'm curious, you know, give us a little bit of your background and kind of your origin story. So what got you into this field? Why did you choose law? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, so I grew up in Katy. Uh, I went to college at the University of Kansas. Um, while uh, after University of Kansas, I went to law school at the University of uh, Texas, UT Law. All right. And uh, it was funny. Uh, after law school, I joined a firm. And one of the first cases they put me on involved construction. And I'd always been interested in construction for, for two re For A main reason is my grandfather was a construction laborer in Louisiana his whole life. He was a carpenter, oh. became a foreman. And it was really interesting because my other grandfather was a lawyer. So I don't know if it was a confluence of, of luck or what, but I ultimately yep. ended up doing both in the industries of both of my grandparents. One was a lawyer and one was construction. Oh, um, neat. So we started to do these cases at my first firm and I realized that I really liked it. Not only were they interesting cases, uh, they were always new issues. It was a fertile ground for the law. Um, disputes are always arising because of all the different actors in the construction industry. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's a kind of a small bar. Uh, there's not a lot of attorneys that are doing construction, but the ones that are, they know each other pretty well. Uh, so one thing led to another. And uh, now I've been practicing for almost 20 years, uh, board certified in construction law. I think there's 120 of us in Texas that are board certified in construction law. Um, so yeah, we represent owners, developers, general contractors, subcontractors, and manufacturers. Um, and all types of uh, construction related issues, projects, project closeout, uh, disputes, mediation, arbitration, and lawsuits. So it's, it's a great group. We started this law firm, West Mermis, five years ago. We split off from another firm. We're now up to eight attorneys, and that's all we do is construction law. Really? That's, a fa that's fantastic. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about the history of the, the firm, but you captured that um, so well. And are, are, is there a particular area of the construction that you find yourself that you get involved in a little bit more? Is it across the board for, you know, all construction or are you, you know, big in the developer space, big in, you know, hotel chains, et cetera, repeat building or? You know, we represent, uh, you know, I'd say there's not, there's not one segment that we focus on more than others. Lately, we have been finding ourselves represent more owners. Um, we do represent a number of general contractors and subcontractors. Okay. But owners have been coming up, coming to us a lot recently. And I think that's because a lot of the general contractors have established um, attorneys. And then when owners approach them, there's usually a conflict. Um, as a result, we're kind of developed a reputation. It's kind of a, a go-to firm for owners who are having issues with their projects, whether it's in real time during the project itself while it's going up, or if it's you know one, two, three years afterwards, or sometimes even 10 or 15 years later. Um, so yeah, we are doing a lot of owner work recently. Um, and it's something that we we like. Um, they're, they're good cases. And it really helps if uh, the owner has uh, has all the information we need to try to help us do our job. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that can be a challenge, especially if you're having to go through all these stakeholders with information and you don't have a single unified place to go to, which is 
sort of the benefit of our software. We try and encourage everybody to put all the communication, all the back and forth documentation and data in one place because it simplifies that process. One, it streamlines everything, makes everybody accountable. But at the end of the day, for what you do, it, it's, it makes it a lot easier for you to understand, you know, where the challenges were relative to the issue and, and potentially best course to move forward where how to resolve a dispute, I would imagine. Yeah, you know, what we found a lot, you know, recently we represented a, uh, a, a truck stop that had a, a number of, of problems with it. And, you know, most of these owners, they're not in the business of construction. They're in the business yeah. of providing medical services if they're a hospital or, you know, gasoline and, can be in, you know, in, uh, in some of those other services that come along with that. Uh, they're not, they don't understand construction. And uh, hopefully that they, they've hired someone to walk them through that. But oftentimes they rely on the general contractor to yeah. kind of be their agent, even though it's not really not their agent. Um, yep. So in, in those cases, you know, we do find that those owners, when things go wrong, they're not really prepared with the information they need to 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 go after the the, the party that caused the problems. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's sometimes that uh, the owners sort of, like you mentioned, depend too heavily on their these folks that they've hired, but they kind of don't realize at the time that th those those individuals, those companies that work for those you know, those firms, whether it be the GC, the sub, even the architects and engineers, they all have their own interests in the project. And you've got to have something that's sort of protecting the owner. What what would you like owners most to know about the importance of how to engage someone like your firm or, you know, you know, getting a lawyer involved early in the process? What did what do you perceive as being sort of the best cadence there? You know, I, I think the, the 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 playbook that owners should always run is if they're engaging in a construction project, if they have the budget, they should definitely hire their own construction consultant, you know, construction manager, someone to help them yep. as the owner rep to interact with the general contractor, interact with the architect. Um, additionally, you know, having an attorney up front, I mean, to help them review the contract, that's huge. Yes. Most of these owners simply sign off on whatever contract is given to them, whether it's an AIA contract yes. or if it's just the contractor's own uh, contract that they've developed in-house. And as you can imagine, those contracts are very one-sided in favor of the general contractor. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, if I can tell owners anything, I'd say, hey, look, spend the money up front, hire a construction attorney, try to rebalance the risk that's in that contract because – Almost all those contracts always tilt in favor of the general contractor. And there are a few provisions, and I'm talking maybe less than 10, that you can really modify to really rebalance the contractual risk. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really good feedback for sure. Do you have, I mean, without going into any specific details where you you were on a, on a case or supporting a client that, you know, maybe everything looked like it was going well in the very beginning, but then because they didn't take those necessary steps, how it, it, it maybe ended up, you know, not having the most desirable outcome or potentially caused a bigger conflict trying to get to the outcome that they needed it to be. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, one of the issues is, you know, these owners, you know, like everybody, you, everybody wants the best deal in town, yeah. but you really need to have an idea of, right. What is this contractor? You know, what's their balance sheet? You know, it, because if they don't have much of a balance sheet, um, if something goes wrong, you better hope that that damage triggers some type of insurance because, you know, first off, you want to make sure they have the right insurance. Yeah. Efficient insurance. But if insurance isn't triggered, and by the way, in Texas, triggering insurance is not a given. But if insurance is not, not triggered, then you're looking solely to that general contractor or that architect's assets. And, and if they don't have much of a balance sheet, I mean, I've seen multiple times where owners have just, uh, you know, they've got into a project and either during their project or afterwards, they realize that there are massive problems with the project mm -hmm. and everybody thinks, oh, well, that's what insurance was for. And they find out the hard way that because they didn't bring a construction uh, attorney on early on or have a construction manager, that the um, insurance is insufficient, the type of insurance is wrong. The balance sheet of the builder doesn't allow them to honor their warranty obligations. All these these terrible things can happen. And then the owner is stuck trying to basically self-fund the repairs or the completion yeah. of the work. And it's and I, I see it happen all too often 
Um, and it's it's heartbreaking because these home, these these business owners they're typically creating these buildings, these structures to employ people, to employ That's people right. and sell a service. And now they're having trouble doing so because of this of the poor construction or poor design. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I don't know if you know this, but one of our passions is school districts and helping school districts maximize the value of the dollars that have been trusted to them to build and renovate and provide the very best learning environments. But it, there have been, you know, a lot of these instances where school districts did exactly that. They didn't really know necessarily to get the expertise on board with a construction project manager, perhaps outside the district's, you know, own staff or to seek legal representation that was really well versed in the construction space. They might depend on sort of the, you know, the in-house counsel, but if they don't have a lot of direct experience like your firm brings to the table, that could be a recipe for disaster. Have you, have you run into any of those types of situations? Absolutely. You know, you know, I often see it that, you know, a, a Lots of attorneys think that they know enough about contracts that they can kind of help negotiate. And what they don't realize is there are there are a number of statutes in Texas in different sections, property code, other civil practice and remedy code that speak to construction projects. I think one of the biggest ones is everyone always assumes that if there's an indemnity provision in there, that it will be, you know, valid. In Texas, there's a number of case law out there that says an indemnity provision has to check some boxes to be valid. I mean, specifically really? It's got to be in all caps. I mean, you know, some, you know, not only in all caps, it needs to be conspicuous. Moreover, it should be bold. I mean, you want all those things because if you don't, and then you try to enforce an indemnity provision, a clever attorney is going to say, "Sorry, this is an unenforceable indemnity provision." And if had the owner known that going in, he could have totally, you know, you know, uh, edited that, or he could have changed the cost. He could have, he could have reduced the cost if he knows he wasn't going to get indemnity. So there's a lot of those things that I, I think that the typical attorney or someone's not involved with construction doesn't realize. These contractors, and I represent a number of really good contractors, they have construction attorneys on retainer or in-house. They don't understand the laws. They are drafting these contracts in such a way to maximize their profit and minimize their risk. And an owner, should, if, if a good owner, is going to do what he can to, uh, to level the playing field, is what I like to say. Yeah. Oh, and that's an excellent point. You know, we, we talk to owners who often say, you know, well, I, I don't really know why I would need my own tools because I've got these, you know, these folks that we've vetted and we, you know, we've taken the time and the effort to go and get involved in these projects and we should trust them, you know, and, and, and of course I know the word trust is in, in quotations, I think in your industry, because it's, it's, it's really, you don't really know these folks, like you said, the balance sheet, where they are, what type of insurance, how, how would they, handle how well versed are they in handling situations that have arisen in the past there there is a real roll of the dice for a lot of these entities in in the instance of an owner that says well you know i you know i i've never had a problem before why would i worry about having a problem now have you run into situations where you know you've had somebody you know a, a client or, or or been involved in a case where an organization has had a long-standing relationship with a GC or, um, you know, an architect that, you know, for whatever reason, something changes or shifts, right? The economy shifts. And now things, uh, you know, the, the output of this project is way different than their prior experience. And now they're sort of, they're, they're struggling to figure out how they, they continue to maintain that relationship yet get it resolved so that they're not out of pocket. Yeah, I mean, I had a, a lunch today with the president of a construction company. He was telling me that he rarely gets into disputes because they're able to work disputes out. And the reason they're able to work disputes out is that they do have an ongoing relationship with their subcontractors. And there's always that promise of additional work. Yeah. That promise of additional work facilitates the resolution. Everyone's willing to eat a little bit of the money to make it work. What I see happen, though, is when those relationships run their course, for whatever reason, maybe there's pricing, maybe there's a shift in management, all of a sudden, you know, the way they've been doing business and working things out, when there's no longer that promise of additional work, all of a sudden they can't work out their issues that pop up because they yeah. know, you know, that we're essentially now strangers going forward. And then that becomes a real problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you, what do you see based on your experience that the issues that arise that most commonly lead to construction litigation? What, you know, what, if you had to pick, you know, the top three to five, what, what would those be? Yeah, I'd say uh, 
disputes about change orders, you know, how much money remains owed. Lots of times when you're in the field, everyone's eager to finish the projects and they're making decisions on the fly and um, they're promised change orders, but maybe they didn't get approved by the owner. So then the GC is saying, I'll get them approved. So it's yep. really cl close out on the amount of money that's left. Um, that's especially with change orders and retainage. Uh, that's another one. Lots of times the GC will hold a retainage and use that to back charge the subcontractor or the owner will back charge the general contractor based on, you know, what's sometimes considered punch list items. Other times they're substantial items. So that's a big fight. Another one's obviously construction defect. You know, when mm -hmm. they're, when there's, when the building or the structure is not performing, it requires, um, requires repairs, you know, and, and in those instance, uh, oftentimes insurance is triggered if there's something called resultant damage. Um, and then when insurance gets involved, all of a sudden, all the parties to the con construction, the owner, the GC, the multiple subs, the multiple sub subs, and even the suppliers, they'll often find themselves in what I call litigation hell. Um, yeah. And sometimes you just you can't avoid that when there is that type of rampant construction defect issues. So those are the ones I see the most. Obviously, there's some liens that are uh, issues. The more sophisticated litigation involves delayed claims. Those are very expensive, though. Those usually require the retention of an expert, usually someone that's running the numbers and trying to figure out how much did this cause and delay. So those are the mostly the biggest disputes I, that I, construction litigation I usually see. Now, that's really good. That's really interesting. One of, one of the things I, I was curious personally to ask you about, because it's come up recently with uh, one of our existing clients, they... Um, they really struggled on their last project to actually get all of the closeout documentation that they were really owed. Right. So all the, you know, the key documentation for these key assets that they're inheriting with this new build, whether it be, you know, the data sheets, whether it be what they're required to do from an owner maintenance perspective, OEM manuals, things of that nature. A lot of times in the construction process, if you don't actually have a formulated approach, it can be overwhelming for the owner at the end, you know, and everybody's excited to get the project done. We just want the keys and, and get going. Kind of like right. you said, you know, we got, we, we have people to employ and, and, and house in these buildings, but a lot of times those things end up becoming, in our, our experience, a lot of disputes and, and issues for the owner. What role do you play in, in that process? Ultimately, if you don't have a good contract, it can become challenging. I would imagine uh, to, to compel them to get that information to, you know, to the owner at, at the time frame that they need it in order to open and operate their buildings, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the key on that again is having what what does the contract say, and you know what really gets anyone to move is money, and if you <laughs> yeah. tie if you tie the funding of their retainage to a complete construction set, project closeout documents, then I can almost guarantee you that that uh, contractor is going to get those documents to them because they want that last ten percent. Sure. Sure. Now, absent a provision like that, um, the contract, the owner has to be creative. I mean, the owner has to try to figure out a way, what leverage do I have to get these documents? And, and quite frankly, lots of times they don't. I mean, if the general contractor has been paid in full. There's uh, no leverage. <laughs> it's tough to have leverage. I mean, you can yeah. make warranty claims. Ho hopefully, if you have an ongoing relationship with them, that you can maybe leverage that to get the documents. Um, but, but it's challenging. Now, if an architect's involved, I have found architects to be uh, you know, not always, but sometimes a little more uh, organized. Depending on what kind of contract it is, they are the agent of the owner. Sure. So in that instance, I do think the architect should play a more active role in helping gather those those documents, which, again, it's just like, you know, no one thinks you're ever going to need those. But when you do, you really need them. Yep, absolutely. Well, I was going to ask you, what, what do you see as one of the most common mistakes that owners do make in the transaction? Is it not having that consultant and not having a good lawyer, you know, review the contracts and have those things? Are there other mistakes that you see that are often repeated that you wish, gosh, if we had only talked to them <laughs> before, right. before this process started? Yeah, I think by far contract review. Um, and I think due diligence on who you're jumping in bed with. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're about to enter into usually multi-million, sometimes billion dollar projects. Now the billion dollar projects, those parties are pretty sophisticated. I'm not sure. as worried about those. 
when we're, when we're helping dry, uh, contract EPC projects, I mean, those are page turn contract reviews. I mean, those things go on for months. What I'm really talking about are the ones that aren't the billion dollar projects, the 1 million, the 10 million, the 50 million, some of those where uh, they're trying to minimize legal spend um, and they just want to get it, they, they want to get it done. And then those are the ones where I, I see project, I see issues uh, pop up uh, more because they're just not used to that. They're not, they don't understand the construction. They don't understand why it, the, the payment for the fees up front, the attorney fees up front really will save them 10 X on the backside. Wow. That's great. I mean, that's a really interesting fact. I, I've got to ask, you know, on, on the uh, approach that you take relative to the, the contracts, you know, I have to assume that one size does not fit all. So each new build, every new project, just because you may have, you know, handled, uh, you know, a project one way doesn't mean that because you're doing a similar project, you know, maybe in another part of town, different part of the country that you don't, that it's probably just as important for you to have that reviewed each and every project, right? Absolutely. I mean, you need to know what venue you're in. Are you in Texas? You know, are you in, um, what part of Texas are you in? Are you in South Texas, in the <laughs> Valley? Yeah. Are you, are you, are you up North or are you out West? Uh, you need to be thinking about all those things. Um, can I stop you there? And, and can yeah. you just clarify for anyone who might not know, like what, well, what, why would that be important to me? Well, you know, if you're if you're in the valley, the, you know it's it has been known for some time, and whether it's fair or not, the reputation is that it's it can be a challenging litigation venue for a defendant. Uh, sometimes even for a plaintiff, but more likely for a defendant. Um, and also with COVID now, at least in Harris County, which is the county where Houston's based, mm -hmm. you file a lawsuit, you're not going to have a trial for three or four years, um, just because all the cases are backed up. So for various reasons, when you're when you're considering the venue, you want to think, all right, well, if we do get a dispute, should we have this go through the courts? Should there be a jury waiver? Should there not be a jury waiver? Should we go to arbitration? What does that arbitration look like? So yeah, I mean, not every every contract should be different. Moreover, you're dealing with different parties. I mean, usually a good contract is the the end product of a negotiation. So you're not always going to get everything you want. But you really want to focus on the big things. You want sure. to focus and you know fight for those, and you're going to have to give up some. But if you can focus on some of those big things, big items, then you've done your job or as best you can uh, entering into that agreement. No, that's that's really good. I mean, that's really good advice. And for those that uh, might be thinking, you know, like going back to the one size does not fit all. You should have those things reviewed for every single opportunity and and. It's an ongoing effort. And and I know for some of our owners and we've got, you know, some smaller repeat builders that we've worked with, you know, it's, yeah, we, we kind of deal with that. But if you think of the long term ramifications and where I, you know, I kind of thought you were going to go with the venue, you know, not only does that potentially depend, you know, on what the outcomes might be, you know, like you said, you know, the reputation of the the southern district i think uh is is a is um you know one that becomes a bit challenging for defendants but you know there's cost associated with those right so if we if we just said ah yeah we should have thought about this but i have to go defend this in in west texas somewhere and uh, you know that there's time and additional investment and and an effort that you have to expend as a, as their litigator to go support them in that effort right absolutely and, you know and also from an owner's perspective I mean, you want to be thinking about something called a flow down provision. I mean, there are disputes flow between down. the owner and the general contractor, but then the general contractor may have disputes with the subcontractor and the subcontractor leans the project. He may have a dispute with the owner and you don't want to be fighting in multiple venues. You don't want to be part of it being a court, other part being an arbitration. So again, you know, whenever a, an attorney is reviewing this for the contractor or the general contractor, you really want to make sure that, you know, you understand the, the full landscape what could happen in a worst case scenario and you're trying to figure out ways to make it if, if, if it goes sideways and becomes a dispute to make it as efficient as possible yeah well and, you know the thing that you you touched on was you know sort of timely resolution if i'm waiting three or four years to have my case heard that how many times have you seen a situation where maybe a building's not operable or you know uh, the owner's out of, you know, out of funds to actually fix what should have been, you know, repaired or what that issue is. Have you have you seen those circumstances where 
I've got to be out of pocket, you know, and hopefully get my 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 money recovered somewhere down the line. But it could be many, many months or years before I see that. But what a impact that has on an owner. Absolutely. I mean, a savvy litigant can use the litigation system, the legal system to bleed an owner dry with attorney fees. You know, think about the carrying costs of fighting a lawsuit over three or four years. You have the real cost of paying your attorney and your experts, but then you have these other soft costs, which are just as real, the distraction from your core business, yeah, the black cloud hanging over your head, the fact that your key employees are having to review contracts and, yeah. and walk the attorneys through that. And then you have, you know, just typical, uh, uh, the f- fact that people's memories fade over time and you lose key employees. So then you're trying to try a lawsuit over a dispute that mm. happened four years ago. Yeah. Most of the key witnesses or some of the key witnesses, they could have left, they could have died, all types of things that could happen. So what I strongly encourage the owners to do is, you know, you can, it, you know, when you're doing a time, uh, an arbitration provision, you can put a time fuse in there. You know, you can say mediation has to occur within two months of a claim and then arbitration has to happen within 12 months. So while it may be, may be considered, quote unquote, a rocket docket, it forces everybody to quickly mobilize and get this case in a position to either settle or try it at arbitration. And I have found when you have that, that, that certainty of a, of a final adjudication it drives the parties to find a business solution. Which is, you know, ultimately what everybody wants, really, you know, right at the end of the day. And and that makes, you know, the efforts that you were talking about on the front end, the investments that you're making in in the time and the contract and the expertise like your firm brings to the table, so critical. And, uh, you know, I can definitely see that. How, how, how have you seen, you know, you were talking three or four years on some of those, you know, dockets, right, for, it has has COVID really impacted construction litigation? Is is that always been that case, or has it gotten worse since? No, COVID? it's gotten worse, and it's not just construction litigation. What's happened is that you know cases aren't being tried because it's tough to get juries down there. Yeah, you know, there's obviously there's COVID going around, and then there's this issue of when you have them together, um, you know, of people getting each other sick. So there's just fewer jury yeah. trials occurring. So, the, so what happens is that the cases keep getting filed, but there's a backlog now. Instead of being 18 months for a trial, now you're looking at three years for a trial. Um, and that's hard. That's hard for any person to understand if you're not part of the legal system. Um, to remedy that, I mean, you'd have to hire, you know, another army of, of judges. You have a lot more space and nobody wants to pay more taxes. No. So, you know, for, for that reason, I mean, there are problems with that, with the clogging of the judicial system. Now, the judges down there, most courts are doing a great job, everything they can to keep the dockets moving. But when you just can't have enough jury trials, there's only so much they can do. So, other, like I said, so there are some alternatives are you agree to waive a jury and have the judge try it, which parties can do. That will reduce the adjudication time by half, probably. And then again, you have the, the private adjudication through the arbitration process. Gotcha. Well, so let me ask you, I'm shifting gears just a little bit. The importance for an owner to control the document data and all of that information early and throughout the construction phase all the way into closeout. How, how critical in your mind is it that the owner has that proactive approach to maintaining and managing that. And then probably a second part of that question is, how can you ensure that the stakeholders that they hire for these projects, uh, you know, hold on to or or provide all the information that's necessary? So, I mean, it's it's critical. I mean, if an owner calls me up and, and this has happened, it happens on a, on a monthly basis <laughs> and they're having issues. And, you know, the thing about problems with buildings is they don't always manifest themselves right away. Yeah. Um, and it, they, sometimes they take months, sometimes they take years. Um, so when they call you up as an attorney, you're only as good to a certain degree as, as your experts, as people that can truly really go out there, kick the tires and figure out what's going on. Well, they can go out there and they can do their visual inspection and they can you know look at the building itself. But they want to see the project file. They want to see the design drawings, the as built. They want to see RFIs. They want to see the communications between the construction parties. It'll let them have a better understanding of 
what was going on, on out there? What was the design intent? How was it executed? And if an owner doesn't have that, well, then the owner's attorney are at a disadvantage. They're trying to figure out what's mm -hmm. happened and they're missing information. Now, the general contractor may have it and the architect may have it. But if you start asking for that information, what what do you think they think is about to happen? Yeah. Stop returning your calls, I'm sure. Yeah, they're, they're not really all that cooperative. So yeah. then you're faced with this dilemma, like, do I have enough information that I can truly provide an opinion as to, yes, there's problems out there, I can file a suit. And if you file a suit or arbitration, then you do have the ability to obtain that information through discovery, assuming it exists. But it's especially difficult from an architect because you can't just sue an architect or an engineer. You have to have another architect or engineer provide you a certificate of merit that says, yes, in my professional opinion, this person was below the standard of care. And it's hard for them to do that if they don't have the documentation. Yeah. So, that, so that's extremely difficult. Now, how do you how do you remedy that? I mean, again, I think the way you do is you have to tie it to payment. You have to it, you have to make it part of the contract. Um, and, it, and if you do that and if you write into the contract that you don't get your retainage until those documents or you are you on top of that, you even say, look, you, know, you have to work with this company and make sure that it is archived or you say you have to, you know, you have to um, retain these documents for three years, five years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, another issue we're running into is, you know, technology advances, you know, every day, every month. Yeah. So lots of times these documents that are being stored maybe you know from 30 years ago maybe it's just some old blueprints that have yeah. you know been degraded you know in some basement yeah. other times it's maybe antiquated software um and you know again companies move locations uh, employees come and go so the continuity of the documents who has custody of them internally i mean that's that's challenging i mean yeah. some of my some of my bigger clients have those robust procedures in place but more often than not they they do not have that they they have a construction guy and uh, john the construction guy he's in charge of that well when he leaves and the new guys takes over all of a sudden just you know he didn't steal anything but you know who knows what his organizational system was yep yep and if you're depending on that organizational system and he leaves and the company doesn't have a clue that he worked for doesn't have a clue how he did it what happens in those situations? I mean, you know, if you can find John, number one, you know, right. maybe you can compel him to explain what he did and how he did it at the time. But that's a real big problem, too. Just all that transitory, uh, you know, behavior that happens just because of the nature of the industry. Right. Yeah. I mean, it can be the difference between having a viable claim and having a non-viable claim. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have the, the documents, I mean, ultimately, the burden is on the owner to prove that something went wrong. Well, how can he do that work if he doesn't have the documents? He doesn't have the project file. So yeah, a claim that could be really, really good can turn into a kind of crap claim because they haven't retained the necessary documents, which is really the evidence they need if they need to convince the general contractor, hey, we're going to go down to the courthouse or we're going to go in front of the arbitrator and we're likely going to win. And if they can prove that, what happens is that the other party is likely to settle, is likely mm -hmm. to work with them to pay them money so that they can do that. So that's uh, the document retention can be the difference between a good claim and a bad claim. That's, I mean, that's really good. I mean, it's really important for our, our audience to hear that because I think that's such a critical factor and something, you know, I'm proud to say that we do a really good job of for owner insight, you know, not that we're, you know, necessarily doing a commercial for the company, but that's really our intent is trying to protect that in, you know, the owner's interest long-term. One question I would have in follow up to the, the the document litigation, you know, sort of that litigation hold process is, you know, in absence of software, have is there a, an approach that you would recommend to owners that they should absolutely uh, try and drive or enforce in within their own systems? But, you know, like you mentioned, software becomes antiquated data, you know, changes hands, how and where we store documents, we move offices, et cetera. With all those things being as they are, what's the level of expectation for holding on to that data and in what, you know, at least form? If you're not going to use technology, you know, to a, a full degree and you're depending on your email for communication with all these stakeholders, do you have a recommendation for an owner out there that, that may not want to get into the software game and just wants to still protect themselves? 
Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I have one size fits all, but I think continuity, yep. making sure everybody knows what this it's important that the whole organization knows, all right, this is where we store this information. This is how we're going to hold this information so that if it becomes an issue two, three, four, ten years from now, uh, this is where we can find that information. And even within big organizations, I, I don't think they've really given much thought as to as to how the, to disseminate that information so everybody knows where they can find the closeout, the project closeout documents. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if someone, if there was a project, uh, you know, the head of construction, for example, of a major uh, hospital, if they had protocols in place, you know, that, that'd be great. Cause then the next person that takes over the position, hopefully there'd be continuity. Yep. But that's not, that's not always the case. I mean, truthfully, as our world continues to migrate to the cloud, um, I, I'm seeing fewer and fewer project documents that are hard copies. Architects, I think, are still retaining some because uh, as people continue to downsize space, um, I, I just think people take it for granted. Oh, I can get this from a general contractor. Oh, I can get this from the architect. And they don't understand how important it is for them to really have their own copy. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, like you alluded to earlier, right? You know, that you, you maybe you can, but most likely, especially if they're going to be a party to a potential, you know, claim or action, you know, down the road, you know, uh, it, getting that information is going to be expensive and hard, you know, to, to get from them. Right. Yeah. And you may not, you know, the, you have to think of the courthouse and arbitration as being a, a, a door and you may not even be able to open that door unless you can truly convince with evidence your, your experts that you have a claim. I mean, it's really yep. hard to convince someone you have a claim if you don't have any documents. Yep. No, that's a really, really good point. Let me, I mean, this is a related question, but just more for my own curiosity, how engaged does your team get as a project is closed out? Do your clients typically, you know, I know they're help, you know, helping ensure and protect themselves on the front end so that all the rules of the game are, are, are clearly established and, and you're putting the best processes and approaches in, in place. But does, do you all find that you get involved towards the end of a project as well to make sure, hey, everything that we had set up was followed and is done correctly? Or do you generally don't see that until there's a problem? We typically don't see that till it's a problem. I mean, okay. I, I have found that the, the clients will hire us early on to help with the contract and then they'll bring us on if there's an issue during the project and then they'll contact us after there's a problem with the project. Usually when they're trying to wrap up unless there's an issue with retainage or something else, we don't hear from them. And quite frankly, that, that's okay. I mean, we're hoping they're not calling us because we're hoping that the project's going yeah. smoothly. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's, it's just like when I'm finalizing a settlement. Oops, things, yeah, no problem. That things can go wrong if somebody's not really there making sure, okay, let's really, let's close up this patient properly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is this has been super fascinating. Mark wanted me to ask you a question about the passage of SB 219 and how that's impacting what you're seeing in Texas. Yeah, well, you know, so it's based on this old case called Lonergan. And Lonergan used to say that the contractor would have, uh, absent some contractual language, the contractor would warrant the sufficiency of the design. And over time, that law completely conflicted with almost every other law in the in the country. Yeah. So this has overturned that. So no longer is that an issue. The general contractors are happy about it. I think most people in the construction industry are, are glad that it's been now the law has been revised so that's in line with the rest of the country. Um, I haven't yet to see how that's playing out as much. Um, I, I do know general contractors are happy about it. Um, but, you know, whenever you're in a position that you're relying on case law, typically that means someone didn't do their job yeah. when they were negotiating the contract up front. Oh, uh, that's a good point. So, you know, if, if there was a takeaway from that for owners, what would you, you know, what would you want them to hear about that process? Get that contract reviewed, make sure it's protecting your interest doing the negotiation. Yes. Yes, every, every two years, you know, when the Texas legislature meets, there's usually three or four new laws that are spinning out that impact construction uh, construction law. So, again, every year or so, you want to make sure 
that you've spoken with the construction con uh, lawyer, you know what the new issues are. And then when a project comes up, yeah, you should have your attorney review it because at the very least, you know, they're going to help you in ways that you may not even know. I mean, for example, you know, um, the, the idea of including a provision in there that allows the prevailing party to recover their attorney fees. I mean, that one provision, depending on how it goes, could be a, you know, a huge line item. It could be hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Um, and again, no one goes into a contract thinking there's going to be a, a problem. <laughs> you know, everyone assumes it's just going to be the greatest thing ever. And quite frankly, most projects go okay. There's no such thing as a perfect project. Most projects go okay. But it's the ones that have problems and then those are the ones that didn't have the right contract. I mean, nothing's more heartbreaking when an owner or a GC or sub approaches me and they've been wronged, but they didn't have someone look at the contract to help them, you know, you know, balance the risk. And all of a sudden they've waived their consequential damages. And meanwhile, like for an owner, that's brutal. Consequential damages, if, if the contractor doesn't build the building properly, the owner can't operate it, can't generate revenue. All of a sudden, those you would think those would be all damages, but if there's a consequential yeah. damage waiver in there, the owners aren't entitled to any of those damages. Oh, that's huge. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's devastating. Uh, they, their damage would be limited to how much it costs to repair the issue, right? Whether that's $20,000 or a million. Meanwhile, the owner may not be able to rent it to any tenants, may not be able to operate his business, generating revenue from the gasoline or whatever it's selling there. And those are all consequential damages and true, true damages. They may not be able to service their note because they're not generating any revenue. So of, of the, you know, the top 10 contract provisions out there, you know, figuring out what's your risk on the consequential damage one and making sure that you're not just because you're not just waiving that because as a matter of law, you're entitled to consequential damages unless you agree to waive it by contract. Yeah. Well, and if you don't have somebody protecting your interest, you may be waiving that and not realizing it, right? Yeah, well, they may say, hey, let's do a mutual consequential damage waiver, which appeals to everybody's sense of fairness, but they don't realize that the risk is asymmetrical, <laughs> that they don't have any consequential damage risk, but you have all the consequential damage risk. Meanwhile, they said, let's just waive it for both of us. Yeah, and and if I'm an owner and I'm trying to be the you know the good good guy at the table and I'm just trying to get my building built, I'm I'm probably just okay. That sounds reasonable because yeah. I mean we're shaking hands on this thing, right? You know, yeah, we're, we're, we're we are in the same boat, you know. Yeah, but it's it's it's, un, it's unfortunate. And you know, there's ways around that, and they could push back. You can have caps. You can have liquidated damages. There's a lot of other ways you can work through those issues, um, but nothing's worse than a contract's been drafted in such a way that a claimant whether it's the owner, general contractor, or subcontractor, is bereft of options because of the contract he signed. Yeah. Well, I I will tell you this has been enlightening, and you know we 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 see things day in and day out that we know that uh, we should be referring some opportunities your direction because there are without question a lot of owners that are sort of trusting the process that everything's going to work out and. And it and you hope it does, like you said, you hope everything works out exactly the way everybody expected. But sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it can be even more costly than you ever thought possible. And, you know, the not only the challenges to trying to protect yourself and 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 and, and just get what is right, right. You know, the costs in litigating and, and just the like you said, the expansive time it can take to get this thing resolved. And if you don't have the documentation, you don't have a good team like you bring to the table, then you really could be left holding the bag in a big way. Yeah. And it can be, you know, it can be to the point that the, the company itself is in jeopardy. I mean, the, you know, you may not, the building, the company, the idea may not be able to operate if you don't have a structure that you, that you paid for. Yep. Well, you know, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't ask you any final words of, uh, you know, advice or guidance for any owners that might see this. And I want to make sure that we have you plug the firm and how people can learn about you all. Yeah, no. Uh, so, you know, West Mermis, we're, we're based in Houston. We're board certified attorneys. We help owners, general contractors, subcontractors with all types of construction issues from beginning of the project to the to the end of the project and then later if there's any claims that arise uh, so yeah we're we're open for business and we're here to help anyone that needs anything with the construction law um i guess the, the you know the my parting words my parting advice to owners would be i guess to, to quote 
um, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> those are amazing words, right? Right. Great I advice. Mean, you know, yeah, kick the tires. You know, you're going to hopefully find the right architect, find the right general contractor, but you know, stuff still happens. And the way you way you minimize those risks with partners, with like GCs and architects that you still like, is you make sure you have your team in place. Make sure you have an attorney that can help you review your contract. Make sure you have systems in place. Make sure that you are keeping tabs, not only on the money itself, the, you know, the project finances, but don't think just when the project's over that it's over because you never know. Something, yeah. there could be latent defects. There could be latent issues. And that's why it's so important to hold on to their project file. Yep. Over is maybe never over, right? Right, At right. The end of the day. That's well, right. Joshua, thank you so much for, I mean, this has just been incredible. Thank you so much for uh, your, it, you know, your, just your guidance and direction on this. I, I feel like I could talk to you for hours and I, we might have to do a follow-up if, if you would allow us. Cause I mean, there's just so much more we could cover. I'm, I'm sure uh, Mark Schwartz, our director of marketing first met you at an event and said, Hey, I think you guys will hit it off and, and we need to you know get you on the podcast. I'm so grateful he did. And I just am appreciative. I know your time is very valuable. I appreciate you making time for us. And thank you for joining Owner Insights Podcast. Yeah, you bet. This is great. I'd love to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate it so much. All right. We, we're out. I apologize. My my wife is the only one that can get through silence. So there must be an emergency. <laughs> so I am so sorry about yeah, that. You better but, get that. Yeah, but I appreciate it. This was, this was really good. What could we be doing to support you and help you? I mean, in all honesty, it's I would love to find some way to you know, send opportunities your way, or at least, you know, if I don't know what the the right rules of engagement are necessarily, but there, clearly I think there's some opportunity for us to to talk further. Yeah. You know, I'd love to cross market market any way we can. Okay. Um, um, and yeah, you know, spread the word about West Mermis and it sounds like, you know, I've, I've looked at you guys product. I think it's a great product for owners. Thank you. So to the extent that some of my, you know, clients are, are looking or asking me for advice on the front side, I'd be happy to uh, tell them you get about your guys' product. We'd appreciate it. I mean, I would, I would tell you, do you do a lot of school district business at all by chance? No, I don't do much school district. I'm really more in the healthcare. I'm representing a number okay. of very large healthcare hospital systems. UMC by chance? No, I'm a Memorial Herman. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they use donor insight for some of their work. Um, they went a different direction when the project team that they had actually hired, they hired a consultant out of Austin when they had some challenges, I think, negotiating the next set of, you know, requirements. I, they didn't go with this firm. So we didn't get an opportunity to have the software. We were kind of an extension of that firm's service offerings. But um, yeah, Memorial Herman, MD Anderson. Yeah, those so are, we've, we've those done are a few. Clients. But no, I mean, I really wish, you know, there's a couple of clients in particular um, right now that I really wish you guys had been able to work with them before. This is really large uh, homeowners association that had uh, these huge lakes built. And, you know, all the homes are now yeah. encircling the lakes. Well, these lakes now, the, the retainage walls are starting to, you know, collapse. And you can imagine the problem that's going to be, well, these, these walls are, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old. So while you think the statue of repose would, would, would be an issue, um, there's allegations of fraud and concealment um, really? by the, cause you, you know how HOAs are usually controlled by the developer. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're passed to the owners. Yep. Well, you know, things didn't happen when they should have went under the developer's control. Um, so now we're trying to go back and figure out, you know, well, what happened? Well, an HOA, much like some of these other owners I was talking to you about, they don't have any systems in place. You know, they, yep. they, they could have very easily though had a, company like yours and they pay some, you know, I don't know whatever your fee structure is, but they could just have those documents there for however, now, however long they need. Now yeah. it's a little bit different. Obviously the developer was controlling it at the time, but, but that's the type of case I'm talking about where, you know, the, the absence of those documents is, has been challenging from our perspective as we're trying to figure out what's going on out there from a forensic side and then who's responsible and how do we go after that responsible party? Yeah. Oh, I could definitely see that. And, you know, without it, it's got to be a challenge, right? You know? Yeah, we're doing everything you and I just talked about. I mean, we're trying to, you know, find some public documents and talk to some GCs and see people will cooperate with this. But again, it's like when anyone calls you asking for that, you know, 
unless you're, you know, a fool, you, you know, they get nervous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a, there's trouble ahead for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, we've said, we've seen it with school districts, even in your area, right. Where we've had some larger school districts like, Oh yeah, our, our lawyers handle all that. It's all good. And it's like, well, you know, are you sure? Cause I mean, you know, the same person that's trying to negotiate some of their, you know, employment contracts and other things. And it, you know, their construction is its own unique animal. And it, and to me, it seems like, and we have, we have one in mind that I may, recommend they at least talk to you all because I know that they have before they brought us on got crossways on some project work and, and it becomes a problem because those districts don't want that to become public, right? They don't want to be part of public litigation because that impugns the public trust. Like, Hey, you told us you were going to build this stadium for X. Now it's costing us a whole lot more, right? And it's not a stadium issue per se, but you know, at the end of the day, it, there is this this propensity to try and you know push these things under the rug as much as possible and keep it down low, but at the end of the day, I know for a fact I've I've heard it from their director. We don't have the documentation to support us. Yeah, and um, there might be opportunity. I don't I don't know if if we were to run into you know districts in Texas that would benefit from knowing you, would that be areas that you would want to? Or some people just say, hey, I don't want to mess with schools. No, absolutely. Okay. You know, we're you know I, I don't know. There's too many clients. I would just say offhand. I. I wouldn't want to represent, you know, okay. obviously we like to work with people that, that are good people and pay their bills. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if the school district can benefit, then I'd love to talk to them. Okay. Well, I, you know, I hope to open some doors. I I'm all about trying to collaborate and find avenues. And um, next time I come to Houston, I will, uh, well, let's go have lunch or dinner or something. I would love to get to know you. And, and uh, I appreciate the time. I, I really do. This has just been hugely valuable and Hopefully we can, uh, you know, get you some additional, you know, visibility because of the the podcast. So no, definitely. Once you guys get this up, I'm, I have an outside social media person, and she's gonna all right it as well. So fantastic. Be, well, we will we, we will plug the heck out of it on our end as well. So we look forward to it. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great you to bet. meet you. Yeah, you bet. This has been fun. All right, sir. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye.